what I share. Okay. You never know what you're going to get when rabbis are sitting and writing sermons for two or three weeks from now, and then they discover, oh, Rabbi Brown's not here this weekend. I have to give two sermons this weekend. So, um, After the flood, Noah opened the ark and looked out, and he saw the earth desolate, forests and gardens uprooted, corpses visible everywhere. There was no grass. There was no vegetation. The world was a wasteland. In pain and dismay, he cried out to God. Sovereign of all creation, he said, in six days you made the earth and all that grows in it. It was like a garden, like a table prepared for a feast. And now, God, you, you yourself have brought the work of your hands to naught, uprooting all that you had planted, tearing down all that you had built. Why did you not show compassion for your creatures, God? Why? Noah asked. And then, according to the Midrash, God replied, O faithless shepherd Noah, now, now, after the destruction, now you come to me and complain? But when I said to you, make for me an ark for yourself, for I am going to flood the earth to destroy all flesh, you did not plead for your neighbors. How differently Abraham will act. He will pray on behalf of the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. And Moses, Noah, Moses, when his people anger me with their calf of gold, Moses will offer his life in place of theirs. But you, Noah, when you saw that judgment was about to strike the world, you, Noah, thought only of yourself, only of your household while all else perished by fire and water and flood. And then Noah understood that he had sinned. When I saw the aerial footage of the devastation wrought by Hurricane Harvey, and now by Hurricane Irma in the Caribbean, and soon we know it will be in Florida, when I saw the aftermath of the flooding in Houston, of my own colleagues whose houses were flooded out, synagogues flooded out. I thought of this Midrash that I just read, this ancient rabbinic spin on the biblical story of Noah. I imagined that what I was seeing on my television, what we were seeing on our television screens, was exactly what Noah saw when he opened up the hatch of that ark and let out that bird of peace to fly away. When he looked out from that ark, after the rainstorms stopped and the flood waters began to recede, that is what he saw, what we saw. And so as I begin to hear the tales of heroic efforts of ordinary citizens, of flotillas of private boats, and armies of civilians linked hand in hand to pull people from the rushing waters, did you see those images? As I saw public officials who did not abrogate their responsibilities as they had in the past, in the interest of politics or party, but instead listened to science, listened to the experts, and offered calm and reasoned instructions. When I saw all of that and heard all of that, I realized why Noah is not the archetype for a Jewish hero, and why Abraham and Moses are. There is no arguing that we have been beaten down this year not only by firestorms and hurricanes and drought and war and famine and earthquakes. We've been knocked off our feet by the people in the news as much as the events themselves. It has been hard to find a hero this year, someone to look up to when everyone is putting each other down. Our politics have become a blood sport. Civility is but a quaint nostalgia and the societal norms and conventions that helped maintain at least some semblance of social order, some thin veneer of mutual respect, they have been blown up with 140 characters on Twitter, Facebook trolls, and fake news about fake news. It has been hard to have faith in humanity, where everywhere you look, people are acting inhuman. 
And so if every cloud has a silver lining, then in the midst of the pain and the devastation, the loss of life and of property, of these storms and fires and earthquakes, they have also exposed, I think, a treasure trove of goodness in ordinary people. Ordinary people who have done extraordinary things. Something changed for me this past week. Watching the devastation was heartbreaking. I have a friend, a colleague in Houston, friends and colleagues in Houston who have only the clothes on their backs. But when I look past the stuff and I see the people, what I see is you see people helping each other, people that weeks before were at odds with each other because of the racial tensions and wars and conflicts in the United States. When I see all of that, people helping each other, I feel a little bit better. A little better about the state of our world. If not its present, then its potential that lies in each of us for it to have a better future. The rabbis under the, of the Talmud understood this all too well. It was why they declared quite prophetically that whoever destroys a single life, it is, is they, as it, as is, it is as if they have destroyed an entire universe. And they say also, and we sometimes miss this second part, whoever saves a life, it is as though they have saved the entire world. We spend a lot of energy focusing on that first part, the destroying and the taking of life. And yet the second part is where godliness lives. The second part is where holiness lives. The second part is where sacred is. In the saving of a life, we are not only saving the life of the person that is in jeopardy, but we uplift and save the soul of those who, looking out on a world torn asunder, may have lost hope, may have lost faith. In the Talmud, Rabbi Judah taught the following. Ten strong things have been created in the world. A mountain is hard, but iron cleaves it. Iron is hard, but fire softens it. Fire is strong, but water quenches it. Water is strong, but clouds bear it. Clouds are strong, but wind scatters them. Wind is strong, but a body bears it. A body is strong, but fear crushes it. Fear is strong, but wine banishes it. Wine is strong, but sleep works it off. Death is stronger than all of these, yet Sadaka, righteous acts, save from death. As it is written, Sadaka delivers from death. What those extraordinary, ordinary people have done in all of these danger zones all around our planet these past weeks, they are acts of Sadaka. They're acts of righteousness. Sadaka is not just the giving of money, it is not even a benign good deed. Sadaka is an act of justice. Through their multiple acts of Sadaka, they have shown me and you and all of us that we are not in the times of Noah. The world does not need to be swept clean and the table reset. There are good people amongst us, kind people, generous people, not on both sides, on all sides. We are not all left and right. We are not indifferent to the suffering of others. We are much more Abrahams and Moses than we are Noahs. The floods and the fires and the earthquakes, they remind us that we are all in the same boat and we will sink or swim together. And this past week, it may just be that a hurricane saved us. Can you hear us may it be God's will. Amen. Our service continues, page 586. We rise for Elena. <laughs> 